In today's video, I'm going to take you around my small home studio and show you that if you really want to record bass really, really well, you don't actually need that much gear. Hi, I'm Dan from OnlineBassCourses.com and if you want more videos a bit like this telling you about bass gear, fretboard knowledge, groove, how to play bass lines, then subscribe by clicking the button below. So before showing you the studio and the gear, I just want to quickly tell you what I actually do with all of this. I've had two locations, the one you see here and a place I was living in before. And in those two locations, I've recorded for about 10 years now via my site onlinebassplayer.com and it's kind of a remote online recording service for bass guitar and double bass. And so I have a website and that's how I get kind of clients and work and things like that. And really I've played on anything you can think of really from amateur singer songwriters all the way up to kind of film and TV composers. In fact, I've actually heard my bass playing randomly about four or five times now on, on TV, Netflix, YouTube ads, all that kind of stuff. So the kinds of people that, that will find my website and use me really do range from the hobbyist amateur to, to top professionals. So, you know, you really, really can do a lot from a home studio these days. So everything runs on this 2010 iMac that just sits on my desk here. And it's, it, you know, it's 2019 now. So this is really an old machine. It's running on Logic Pro X. I don't even run the latest version of that. So that's a pretty simple setup, really. And it's one that I've been using for, for a number of years now. I'm only really recording audio. I, I do backing tracks and things like that. So Logic's quite good for that. I have a Roland XP30 for any of those backing tracks, you know, playing keys, any ideas as a kind of MIDI controller. And then what I would say with bass really is that audio digital conversion, that's the big thing really. You've got all these lovely analog basses and you've got to get it into the computer and out. So this is really one area to, to make sure you buy quality gear. That's a, a Universal Audio Apollo 8, which I think is, is absolutely brilliant. I'll show you later my double bass, but that runs four signals and this just takes care of it. I use the plugins on it and it's really fantastic. Just below that is a Motu ultralight which i just use to run the, the midi off the off the xp30 but that really is that's the kind of brains of the of the studio and and that's an area not to skimp on uh, other companies that do really good stuff as apogee and personas are doing some good ad converters that are relatively inexpensive monitor wise i have these neumann reference monitors and I'm not doing much mixing or anything here so that's really just so I can hear my bass nice and, and loud if I want that or if I don't I've got headphones here the AKG K240s which are okay not bad at all uh, to be honest with you I'll probably use the headphones more often than not the other big thing really especially for bass players is to have a really really good DI most well, I don't know if it's most really. I mean, two of the classic ways of recording is DI straight into your desk and or an amplifier. So what I tend to do is I have this this Avalon U5, which is industry standard. It's absolutely brilliant. I don't you can color the tone on that, but I just run it flat and it just gives you the transparent sound of the bass straight in. And when I'm sending all my tracks off around the world, as I do every day, that's the signal that I'm giving and then I give a throughout into either an amp or I'll show you in a second but um, I mean I really don't know when I send my stuff off to people what they do in the mix but what they really want is a nice you know warm clean tone really and you can add so many plugins and re-amp and do all kinds of things so the Avalon really does it for me. Uh, before I forget those lovely cables there are evidence audio and I use Providence as well that's another area I would say you know don't skimp on that because you know people do ab tests and they swear by these things and and i sort of believe them so i went i went to get good cables really i've got a dbx 163x compressor there i don't really tend to use that that much but it's nice to have it and, and an 11 rack above which i use for sort of any guitar stuff i do which I don't do an awful lot of, but it's nice to hear. I've got a horrible empty space in the rack there that I need to fill just visually, really. No, I don't need anything else in there, but that 11 rack does the job there. Now, this is another thing that I tend to use a lot, actually. I mean, I use the, the Avalon down there all the time. The throughout of that tends to go into this. This is a, 
uh, Monique by Jewel. It's a handmade chew preamp uh, from Jewel Potter in the States, and it's it's brilliant. This, so I can I can do a number of things with this. The it's sitting on an M seven hundred, which is the power amp, and I don't use that in the studio. I use that that live that going into a speaker cabinet just sounds absolutely mighty. So that's a fantastic piece of gear. That what I'll often do is I'll use that Avalon as my kind of clean signal. And what you do really with bass, well, there's so many things you can do, I can't reduce it to one sentence, but a lot of people will, will take a second signal for something with a bit more character, a bit more sort of harmonic saturation, and that does it. So I'll, I'll have that as my amp track, even if I'm not using an actual amp, which I do have and I'll show you. But this pedal here, I've been using this recently, it's the Tech 21 NYC VT bass pedal. And I'll often come out of the of the Avalon and go into that. And that gives you a really great tone. I mean, the, the graphics on the amp there, there's a bit Ampeg B15 SVT. I think that's what they're going for. And you can get um, really subtle tones all the way up to some quite cranked overdriven tones. And that's been really great, especially for rock stuff, but even not. Um, Paul Drew from the Studio Rats, who's a world-class mixing engineer, guitarist, producer, writer, he does everything. He uses this, and that's that's why I bought it, really. And some of the recent Studio Rats tunes, which I'll link to, I've been using that on, and it, it sounds absolutely brilliant. So, moving on. So there is one actual amp that I went to a, to a gig, actually, those guys there, Danny and the Champions of the World, fantastic band, check them out. Went to a gig and their bass player, Chris Clark, had an old Fender Precision bass and he was playing one of these. This is a 1977 Fender bass man. And I bass, I think it's a 50, it's the silver face one. And I just bought one on eBay that day. It was under a grand and it's just, it sounds amazing. I don't get to use it a lot in this setup, but I have taken it to studios and used it before. And it's a nice option to have that. This is my late 1800s factory German bass. I had a, um, a double bass before, which was, I think it was a Zeller. It's kind of like a student bass and it just didn't cut it. I mean, the unfortunate fact is with double bass that it, it seems like you have to spend good money on it. I took out a loan, I bought this and it just revolutionized my, my tone really. I've got a DPA body mic there and a David Gage realist and I will mic up the bridge and the fingerboard somewhere like there where the, where the sort of fingerboard meets the body. And I'll take four signals, which is overkill, and I'll go into that Apollo 8 with the plugins, and it just sounds it just sounds brilliant. Now, I'm not in Abbey Road here, obviously, so I close mic everything, and you just get the sound of this bass, and it's, it's brilliant. It's taken me a long time, you know, to get the money together for that, to get the the knowledge of, of how to record it and, 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 you know, how to play it and tune, all that kind of thing. But it's really worth it. That's fantastic. So this bass here, I'll just... Um, that's kind of really it in terms of the, the kind of hardware side of things. I'll show you the basses and an amp. But this is a... Um, that's a 1978 Fender Precision. I bought it in 2008. And when I bought it, it just... It became... I was sort of treated a bit more like a bass player. I was doing a session and um, it was the Ken Nelson, the Coldplay producer was on it. And he said it's one of the best he's, he's heard recorded. I bought it in London and it was relatively cheap. I was seeing 5,000 basses across the road on Denmark Street. And I saw this in one Joe guitars, which is fantastic. And it was cheap, you know, 1,200 quid. This has done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of recording. And really, as a bass player, you can't go wrong with a P bass. You're about to see loads of other basses I have, but this bass kind of sits in the mix. There's a reason that loads of bass players have used, you know, instruments like this. Now, just thinking about it, one of my favourite basses now that I'm playing a lot of is my 1975 Fender Jazz. I haven't got it in the studio right now, but I'll do some videos on all these basses because they all have different characters and different sounds and can be used for different things. That one is my 1968 Fender Precision, and it's strung with James Jameson Labella flatwounds. Great for hip hop, kind of vintagey, old school stuff. Uh, Pino Palladino kind of popularized that from the late 90s with his stuff with D'Angelo and the Neo Soul kind of movement. And you know, that hasn't gone out of fashion since coming back in really, and, and I don't think it ever will. So what have we got here? We've got a Boss Octave OC2, that's a classic bass pedal. For kind of 60s tones or or 
that sort of thing. This is a Framus late 60s, I don't know the exact year, hollow body bass. And, you know, it doesn't have to be restricted to 60 things. A lot of bass players like to, you know, have a tone that's a little bit out of the box. Like the the P bass will fit into almost any style of music, but sometimes you want something a little different. That too has labella flat wounds on it. Now this amp here, that's a 1966 Ampeg B15, and that's kind of the holy grail benchmark really of amps. And whilst I don't get to use it too often here, it just is a brilliant thing to have. And I take it to two studio sessions if, if they kind of exist anymore, which there are fewer and fewer. But for me, I've got my my online, you know, online bass player.com. So I do loads of sessions regardless of what the state of the of the industry is in, in London, which is one of the best places to do it. So yeah, got these bases tend to cover every kind of sound I need. Like I say, I'll do I'll do some videos on the individual ones. And if you've got any questions on any of these, leave a comment in the comment box below and I'll I'll let you know. But here we go. That's a JMJ Mustang, Justin Meldal Johnson. And if any of you are looking for a relatively cheap bass, it's under a thousand pounds, that, that's great for recording. Maybe you're a guitarist. That's a short scale bass. Really, really easy to play. It it's kind of looks tiny, but it's got a huge, huge sound. They are amazing basses, and that's gonna be that's just gonna be a classic, that one. I really highly recommend you check that one out. Got a Rickenbacker 4001 there, 1978. That really that's the only bass that creates that tone. A 73 Gibson EB3 down there. And I kind of went for a lot of the 70s basses when I was start when I was starting to sort of build this sort of session collection, if you like. They were relatively cheap, so that's why I got them and they sounded good. I I, I went to and tried them out. You've got to do that when you're playing these. This fender here is a lie, that's not a fender at all. That's a warmth neck and a warmth body, and I put this whole bass together, bare knuckle pickups, Tomastic Infeld flat wounds. Again, just for another tone. When I put it together, it was just a bit of a laugh really to see see what it was all like. It was quite fun to do. This is a great bass here, the Lakeland. It's a fretless. I bought that from the bass gallery in London. And Pino Palladino had this before me. He played on a couple of David Sanborn records in the 80s with it. And the hard case has got some Joan Armour trading stickers on it. That's really cool. And again, you know, if anyone wants fretless, which they do every now and again, you need a fretless. Nothing else is going to approximate that. So that bass does that. Again, another bass. I sh they're in the next room. I sh should have got them out. But is a NS Ned Steinberger upright, electric upright sort of stick bass that Tony Levin uses. That sounds a little bit like a fretless, and that's, that's cool as well. This white one is an Eastwood classic. Now, that's another one that does this similar kind of thing to that bass there, kind of 60s-ish tone. That's a really cheap bass, but it's it's really great. You can see a couple of the knobs there have fallen off, but you know, what do you expect from a cheap bass? But they sound fantastic, and I really recommend checking those out as well. I don't use this six-string Tobias that much. It's one of the, the ones just before they sold to Gibson, but I've always wanted one. I love Jimmy Haslip, so that's really great for messing around with ideas, chords, and things like that. What's that? The next one, we've got my Stingray 5. Now, that's the bass I use live probably most, although actually I'm, I'm really favouring going back to four strings, really. But this covers everything. If I'm doing shows that need below E, if I'm doing gigs where there's a couple of tunes, I just use one bass and that's it. And this one is a Fender Jazz made in Japan. The only thing original on that one is the body. I've changed everything on it. That's kind of a modern jazz sound and it's got a null preamp so I can get that kind of Marcus Millery type sound. And lastly, I think in here anyway, is this 1978 Music Man Stingray 4. So any Bernard Edwards kind of stuff, Lewis Johnson, funk stuff, that bass does it. It does funk really well, it does rock really, really well as well. You can just see some dark orange marks on the neck and that's where we tried to, to heat it to, to to get the truss rod moving because the neck's a bit dodgy on that, but no joy, got burnt a little bit. And luckily it kind of plays well enough. It's a little bit of a struggle to play that bass, but it just sounds so good. Got a few pedals. Now this is a this is a live pedal board that I use, but it's nice to have the option of of some sounds in the studio. I've got a Line 6 M5 there, which is, you know, does every sound you want. Dark glass, vintage microtubes. The yellow one is a 
is a, oh, I can't even remember what it's called, Matryoshka I, banana effect or whatever. That's a synth kind of pedal, which I really wanted a good synth sound. And that does some, but it's a bit overkill, that one. Um, Octave, EBS Octabase. Proton is 3-leaf audio Proton, which is kind of envelope filters. Sadowski for a bit of EQ, but that classic kind of Marcus Miller tone again. And that Origin FX Cali 76. I'll do a video on that. It's a brilliant pedal, that compressor. So what else have we got? That's pretty much it. On the door there, I've got a Carla Uke bass, ukulele bass, which, I mean, that's the craziest bass I have. It's tiny, but it sounds just so, so massive. Probably the last thing to show you is this um, little couple of drawers here with some more effects. This is the Line 6 M13. Again, loads and it's all those old style Line 6 pedals that they had, all the DL4 and all that. They're all in there. And, you know, sometimes you might need a crazy sound and I'll come up with one through that. But plugins these days are amazing. The Neural DSP dark glass plugin I was using for some rock stuff and it just sounds amazing. So to really, you know, live obviously i'm still using all these these pedals and in the studio it's sometimes nice as well especially analog stuff but the the plug-in situation is really great another draw up here so this baseball's at the front that's the first pedal i ever bought and i still got it but really that's not many pedals i mean some people have hundreds but i just want a few sort of classic bass effects just in case i need them so I hope you found that useful. And if you've got any questions at all about any of the gear or how I use it, things like, you know, gain structuring, how to create bass tones in different styles, anything like that, I'm going to be doing videos on that in the future anyway. So that's a good reason to subscribe. But if you do have any questions, easiest thing to do is probably leave a comment below and I'll get back to you or make a video on that. But just really wanted to show you that, yeah, I do have lots of basses, but like I say, you only need a couple. And you can really be doing very top professional work with the, the minimal of gear. And that's really the amazing thing about the world we live in and the companies that are making this amazing gear for us. So my advice is just, you know, get get a good little decent setup going and then and then focus on the craft of of playing or engineering or producing or whatever it is. So I hope to see you on the next video. Take care.